If you enjoy this content, please like and comment to feed the algorithm god. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Oh, to know the tales of the Thimerians. Though they were not the first to delve and wander, their actions and names would ring on through the events to come. It's hard to say what this powerful race began as, but we can speak of what they became. Once surface dwellers, the Thimerians discovered the remnants of an underground ancient labyrinth, which they would expand upon and know as Thimeru. With the passage of time, they came to discover cosmic secrets within Thimeru, but in their early days of discovery, they acted with grace and care. They must have learned from elder civilizations to not tempt and test what lay within the labyrinth. Instead, the Thimerians discovered what would become known as the Eldritch Truth. But what that truly was, I couldn't say. But we can dream and ponder the potentials of what this meant, however. Within the unending halls of their new home, they found slumbering beings called Great Ones, cosmic deities that seemed godlike and were not of this world yet still. There they were. The Thimerians did not try to conquer or control the Great Ones, no. They acted as guardians instead, honoring them and protecting them. They became a tall, porcelain-skinned people with affinities to magics and cosmic powers. They built Thimeria dungeons and traps to keep safe the Great Ones, to keep out curious and devious types. That was most wise of them. For unspoken generations, they lived harmoniously in proximity to the Great Ones, trying to understand more of this eldritch truth and the desires and motivations of these supposed gods, yet as these things tend to go, that changed with the passage of time. Adherence to the dangers of the Great Ones were slowly disregarded. They came to see themselves as rulers, an elevated and favored people. The mighty Thimerians established a kingdom and rulership. They would serve a monarch, who would carry a title shared with the name of their capital city, Thimero Uhil, typically a woman, their queen. And as interactions between the Great Ones and the Thimerians became more commonplace, the ways of this kingdom changed. So, know well why it is said to fear the old blood. The neighboring kingdom of Loran fell to a beast scourge, lost to the sands, a horrific fate for its people, but how? How could something like this happen? Well, it was the blood. The consumption of the blood of the Great Ones. It was supposed to be a means to heal sickness and to transcend what it was to be human through communion by those most dedicated no longer bound by the fear of pestilence and disease, and with time, surely those most devout to the blood would too become godlike. Whether this was a gift from the Great Ones or a sacrilegious harvesting of them, I cannot say. But what came of it is quite clear. Far away from the influences of the Great Ones, those who drank of their blood first began to fall to beasthood. Children ceased to be born alive, an unforeseen side effect of partaking in the cosmic wonder. But the practice of consuming blood had become so widespread that the fall of this empire was written in it. It wasn't immediate, but it was cruel. The hubris of the Thimerians would be their own downfall, and the dead began to pile up. The end was approaching. Yet a new queen was crowned. She took the name Yarnum, and she was chosen by a great one to bear a child. The one called Odin is believed to have caused her pregnancy. A great one who transcended all other great ones. So powerful was he that he held no physical form, Willing or not, through a blood contract of wedlock saved only for those who would carry a special child, Queen Yarnum carried this child of blood. Though, Yarnum met with a terrible fate. The blood of the queen was restorative to her people, but more than that, it was addictive, it was deeply desired. The need for blood amongst her people, it never ceased. Some found reprieve with blood rapture, a cascade of violence inflicted upon their fellow Thimerians deep within the labyrinth. But always, they longed for the blood of Queen Yarnum. So precious was it, that it was studied and sampled, yet there could never be enough to sate those that remained. It's not known why or how, but deep into her pregnancy, the queen was bound and her child cut from her body. Mergo, they would be called. Powerful but unseen, much like their father Odin, but very much alive. The unseeable infant Great One Mergo was taken from their mother and put into the care of another, and the queen was locked away deep, deep within the labyrinth of the Meru. The age of this ancient civilization passed. Survivors left their subterranean home to establish new ones. And as decades turned into centuries, knowledge of the Thimerian people and their forbidden practices were widely lost. 
But of the survivors, let us speak of those who set the stone for a castle that would become known as Canehurst. The nobility of Canehurst is an elder faction of this land. With the cosmic inquiries of the Fumerians bleeding away its influence over the land, new hierarchies and scientific endeavors were created, and Canehurst was at the forefront of recovery and innovation. They did not entirely forget their roots as descendants of the Thumerians, but found a different path forward. The practice of imbibing blood remained, and the Canehurst people were well aware of the beast scourge that still plagued parts of the land. They knew of the threat that came with consumption of corrupted blood, but found a way to temper their thirst. They seemed more keen on blood sharing, in particular from their queen, rather than harvesting potentially scourge-tainted blood. The Knights of Canehurst developed combat arts to discreetly handle any beasts that found themselves in or near their home. Eventually, they began to delve into the depths of Thameru, discovering lost relics and artifacts from their past, bringing them back to Castle Canehurst and integrating them into their society. As Canehurst grew in numbers and strength, some left the castle to establish a new city atop the ruins of Thameru. They called the city Yarnum after the final Thamerian queen. As the decades passed, Yarnum became independent, its own society quite different from Canehurst. But always, Canehurst enjoyed a sort of preeminence over the city, perhaps viewing themselves to be superior to their Yarnumite cousins and perhaps to the chagrin of the now-developing political parties within the city. Yarnum became a massive city with a population to match. It was far less influenced by now ancient Thamerian practices than Canehurst, as though the city was truly finding its own way forth. Beyond a close-by forest but still considered part of Yarnum, a college was built called Bergenworth, a place of higher learning attended by a variety of students from all across the land, including some from Canehurst. Under the direction of a man called Willem, Bergenworth became an institute dedicated to studying the depths of human knowledge and transcendence of the mind. Master Willem believed mankind to kind of be a disappointment, a shadow of what it potentially could be. His desire to influence the evolution of man spurred the order that students be sent into the ruins beneath the college to explore the secrets of what lay within. Of note, under Master Willem's tutelage were a group of young scholars named Lawrence, German, Maria, and Mikolash. Perhaps it was they that made the discovery, but out of the labyrinth came just what Master Willem desired and so much more than he bargained for. Knowledge of the Great Ones, the old blood itself, and an unknown simply called the Holy Medium. And whilst you may gasp at this as an impending doom, things did not fall astray in an instant. This knowledge of Great Ones existing beneath their feet and the obtaining of the old blood could have simply been academic tools held at a distance, respected and studied at arm's length. But, nah. The ambitions and greed of mankind is boundless, is it not? The Thumerian Labyrinth was riddled with warnings of violence and bloodshed, but it was not heeded. The next step in human evolution was far more important to Master Willem and his Bergenware scholars. For the next few decades, the old blood and the great ones were studied. But Master Willem had the sense not to tamper too greatly with the old blood. Instead, he favored the route of elevating consciousness through the use of what became known as insight to gain inhuman perception and enlightenment, to see the world as it truly was in a cosmic sense, to even perhaps gain the ability to communicate with the Great Ones themselves. The disuse of the old blood was a temptation to one of the students of Bergenworth. They were of Canehurst, where the royalty would be most interested in the old blood of their ancestors. So, in secret, the young scholars stole away some of the blood and took it back to Castle Canehurst. Their queen, Annalise, partook of it, becoming an immortal and giving birth to what would be called the Vile Bloods. Through the sharing of their queen's corrupted blood, all within Castle Canehurst would become a Vile Blood. Though the name Vile Blood in and of itself may just be propaganda, who's to say if anything within Castle Canehurst truly changed once Queen Annalise became undead and her people drank of her blood? They laid no siege to their neighbors, nor planned anything devious against them. Rather, those of Canehurst remained enigmatic and reclusive, with their eyes upon the world, watching with great interest at the events unfolding. One day, Master Willem of Bergenworth received news of something most wondrous happening at a far-off fishing hamlet. Some time ago, a Great One had washed up on a shore near the hamlet. The presence of this Great One had caused the people that lived nearby to physically change. They worshipped it. They called it Kos. And when Willem heard news of this happening, he sent a party to hunt this creature down and to cull the village. These hunters, they found the fishing hamlet, and the slaughter began. The people here could not defend themselves. There was no reasoning to be had with the Bergenworth hunters. The inhabitants were killed, dissected, studied, and left to rot. Then they found cause on the shoreline. It's not known explicitly what they did to her, but it was horror. It was blasphemous. 
Koss was with child, and oh, how the Great Ones yearned to have children. But in such cruelty, the hunters killed her orphan. Though know this, Koss was a Great One. Death would not come so easy to her. Koss cast a curse of blood over all who did this to her and her child, one of those hunters being Maria of Canehurst. Maria was so sickened with their actions and remorseful for her deeds that she threw her weapons into a well and vowed to never return to Bergenworth. This did not spare her Koss's wrath, though. Upon them all would fall the hunter's nightmare. They were condemned to eternally walk within it, never free from the violence and horror of their trade. Their death in the waking world would see them brought here, and all hunters who walk their path would meet the same fate. Or should their lust for violence grow too great in life, then they would fall into the nightmare before facing that death. The blood-drunk madness would be punished, and there would be no escape, not even for the repentant like Maria. This fate. The nightmare. It would remain a testament to the old sins. After the fishing hamlet's desecration, Master Willem began to experiment on a new idea that stemmed from the dissections performed upon the victims there, and a peculiar item brought back by the hunters. Koss's umbilical cord. But what did this inspire? Well, eyes. More eyes for greater insight. Line the brain with eyes to elevate his being and thoughts to those of a great one. Only then could man ever match their greatness. Willem began experimenting with, well, collecting eyes and putting them into the skulls of test subjects. But his experiments produced results. Greater insight was linked to the mind's eyes. Willem would continue this course of study with the intention of one day lining his own skull with eyes so that he himself could ascend. Willem did not yet use Koss's umbilical cord. It was still a great unknown and perhaps too dangerous to toy with until there was more certainty on the matter. One of Master Willem's students, the one named Lawrence, took issue with this route of study. Lawrence believed the answers they sought were within the old blood, and that they should utilize it in their studies rather than rely on trying to commune with the Great Ones. But Master Willem feared the old blood. He knew of its beastly qualities and he was right to tremble at it. Obtaining greater insight into forbidden and unseeable knowledge led the Bergenworth scholars farther from beasthood. It was a balance to the beastly nature of the old blood. But Master Willem was so unwilling to use the old blood, and Lawrence grew tired of the academics of Bergenworth. So, Lawrence left the college, and he took with him the old blood and a large part of that umbilical cord. Before his departure, Master Willem warned Lawrence against what he was planning to do, but Lawrence refused to heed his teacher's warning. Fear the old blood fell upon deaf ears. Lawrence took it to Yarnum and began laying the foundation for an institution of his own. Lawrence's betrayal caused an upheaval at Bergenworth. Many of its students and scholars sided with Lawrence's beliefs that their answers were within the old blood and that they should abandon the college. Some students remained, enough to carry on with experiments and studies, but it was the end of Bergenworth's golden era. Lawrence and his group of scholars established the Healing Church within Yarnum. They began to speak quite publicly about the healing properties of this old blood and began administering it to the sick. Support for this new church spread like wildfire across the city. A grand cathedral was built, churches went up, and further expeditions into the labyrinths beneath Yarnum were commissioned. An orphanage was built, funded by the Healing Church, a place of scholarship and experimentation upon the orphans. The Healing Church used children. They used them to create higher-thinking individuals, highly indoctrinated, who would also seek ascension in their lives. This became the foundation for the choir, and those children who grew into adults and leaders within the Healing Church would in turn inflict experimentation upon younger generations within the orphanage. It became a source of indoctrinated followers as well as disposable test subjects. Also created shortly after Lawrence's departure was the School of Mensis, founded in the nearby village of Yahargo, made up of scholars who had departed from Bergenworth. The School of Mensis was more in line with the teachings of Master Willem and his study of insight and the cosmos than the old blood teachings of the Healing Church. But the school was far more ruthless in its actions than Master Willem ever was. The village of Yahargal was seen as an experimentation ground, where the School of Mensis could do whatever it took to make cosmic contacts. No life was sacred, no deed was too taboo, nothing was too destructive. But the school acted as an ally to the Healing Church during its establishment, giving it a seat of importance within the burgeoning institution. And to reward their loyalty, Lawrence gave to each of the institutions part of the Great One umbilical cord that he had taken from Bergenworth. Deep within the ruins, the Healing Church found something. They found the daughter of the cosmos, Ebrietus. Though she was not a true Great One, it was only because she had not been raised to ascend as one. Ebrietus was not hostile to those that entered her chamber, 
Rather, she allowed them to study her, to draw her blood. The study of blood ministration began within the healing church, and the choir would see to this. The choir had come to act as leadership within the healing church, alongside the school of Mensis, and those within the choir would now act as liaisons between Ebriatus and the church. With blood ministration underway, news of the miraculous healing blood of Yarnum spread far, and people began to flock to the city. It underwent an economic boom and expansion to accommodate the influx of people seeking cures. But it was not long until the beast scourge began to appear. It wasn't like the lost kingdom of Loran that fell so quickly to the plague. There were steps taken to stop the creatures when they appeared. The former student of Master Willem, the one called German, paid heed to the appearance of the plague and became the first of the true hunters. He refined the tools needed to take down the horrors and set up a workshop dedicated to sharing this knowledge with some other potential hunters and equipping them for their hunts. German even trained some of them himself. And members of the Healing Church also stepped in to become powerful hunters like the one called Ludwig, the first of the church hunters. Under the cover of night, when called upon by the Healing Church, German and the hunters would end any outbreaks within the city. Knowledge of these hunts were kept secret from the general population by order of the Healing Church. Weeks turned into months, turned into years. The outbreak of Beast Scourge did not relent, yet it was manageable, but a deeper and unacknowledged issue was presenting. So desirable were the euphoric effects of this miraculous yarn of blood that citizens and visitors were addicted to it. Wealth flooded into the city, and the Healing Church enjoyed every benefit of it. And by extension, so did the School of Mensis and the Choir. There was very little motivation to pull back on the citywide usage of blood, save the outbreaks of violent beast mutations. But what do the lives of a few matter when unchecked power is in play? Then, the first of the great tragedies struck the city. Within the district of Old Yarnum, an illness began to present. Something most suspicious and mysterious. A sickness called Ashen Blood. If you believe the rumors, it came from the Healing Church itself. They poisoned the water supply of Old Yarnum to push more of the population into using their miracle cure of Old Blood. Or perhaps it was just a rogue tragedy that no one could have foreseen. But as the illness spread, so too did the Beast Scourge. Old Yarnum was overrun with the infected, and a crew of hunters called the Powder Kegs descended upon it to fight off the Scourge. But the combination of beasts infected with ash and blood and the violence of their transformations made them a whole new threat, and the powder keg hunters were slowly cut down one by one in the streets of Old Yarnum. Out of desperation, those that remained lit the entirety of the old district on fire to stop the spread of the ash and blood and kill the beasts within. No one would be getting out, and this tore apart those few that remained of the powder kegs. They were not soulless, blood-drunk hunters, it weighed heavily upon the hearts of those that still lived. In penance and sorrow for what happened in Old Yarnum, the powder keg hunters remained there. They kept the infection in check and kept other hunters out of Old Yarnum. Within those tortured infected, the powder keg hunters still saw human beings, lives that were worth preserving. So none would be allowed to hunt there unless they wanted to face the explosive power of the powder kegs. And in response, the healing church deigned them to be heretics and enemies. In response to the events escalating within the city, back at Bergenworth, Master Willem ordered the gates to the college be closed and the path there blocked away. Only by using the password of Fear the Old Blood could anyone gain access to Bergenworth now. The number of students at the college began to dwindle and Master Willem became more unhinged. He continued on with his practice of lining skulls with eyes to gain contact with the Great Ones. Yet still, progress there continued on. It was a different sort of chaos than what was taking place within the city. And then, the once hunter, Maria of Canehurst, as though to mark the end of this particular era, did something. She had abandoned the hunt and taken up work in a research facility, housing victims of the choir, the church, and the school of Mensis, as though trying to make amends, but in sorrow for her actions against the people of that fishing hamlet and the creature called Koss, Maria took her own life. And she entered into the hunter's nightmare eternally. There she stayed, high within a clock tower, guarding the secret of what happened at that fishing hamlet, keeping safe the source of the nightmare from any who might wish to end it. Even after Old Yarnum was burned, the use of blood did not slow down within the city. In fact, it became another source of income. Amateur hunters began to take to the streets at night, as the fact that there were beast transformations became far too commonplace to hide from the public. 
Yarnamites and outside enthusiasts would walk the streets, causing mass casualties from careless killing and the unanticipated violence of the beasts themselves. But regardless of what citizens and tourists chose, the hunters of Yarnum continued to train and grow in numbers. Their diabolic methods of butchery and slaughter refined over the years to match the madness of what continued to take place in Yarnum. Yet despite this, the addiction to and dependence upon blood continued to grow, and the healing church did nothing to put a stop to it. The choir and the school of Mensis continued on in their ways as though nothing were amiss. Year after year, the choir produced powerful clerics and scholars to serve the healing church, looking to the skies to learn of the Great Ones. And the School of Mensis became an insane and untethered organization free from any checks. They resorted to kidnapping, torture, killing large groups, it really didn't matter. Everything was nothing when it came to achieving transcendence. But it was Lawrence once again who changed the course of so many lives in pursuit of something cosmic and caused a domino cascade of nightmares overlapping with nightmares. For you see, Lawrence had grown quite brave in his pursuits. He still possessed a part of that umbilical cord that he had taken from Master Willem at Bergenworth, and now he would use it. With his friend German at his side, Lawrence beckoned the moon. How he did it, I could not say. Whether through ritual, if he consumed the cord, if it acted as a lure, but a creature called the Moon Presence descended to meet with Lawrence and German. This is what Lawrence had sought all of his academic life. This is what his former master had so desired, but it was he that had accomplished it. They had an audience with a true great one. German was lost to Lawrence, his dear friend gone. The moon presence fooled German into acting as the host to a new dream, the hunter's dream. German would eternally act as its keeper. He would see to all hunters that trek through as an armorer and a guide. And here, in exchange, perhaps, German would be able to bring back his beloved Maria in some way. For you see, German was devastated by the loss of Maria, who now resided within the hunter's nightmare. He loved her. He longed to have her back somehow, and he feared that he too would be destined to fall into that horrible place that she now walked. Within this new hunter's dream, he would try to rebuild her with a lifelike doll. He would be spared the hunter's nightmare, and the mood presence would be able to anchor itself to this plane, anchor itself to German. It is hard to know the motivations of a great one, impossible perhaps, but the moon presence seemed to desire that this wild hunt continued within Yarnum. The path humanity found itself on served some unknown purpose. All great ones desire a surrogate to carry its child, so in its own way, the moon presence would use the dream, the hunt, German, the hunters, all of them, to find its own child. Oh, German, you fool. The deal was struck, the hunter's dream created, and he was trapped within. Lawrence, though. Lawrence would be returned to the waking world to contemplate his grave mistakes. He felt of this moon presence a consuming doom. It wasn't the transcendence that he so desired. He himself was cast aside and left to fear an unknown approaching horror from the sky. But he did not forget German, his friend, trapped in the dream now. And Lawrence did not lie down and surrender to fate easily. He too had long been consuming blood, and he knew the fate that awaited him eventually in beasthood. The moon presence had not spared him of it. So on he continued, desperately trying to find new answers for both German and himself. But this too led Lawrence down a fruitless road. He overconsumed in blood, sought answers in the Thumerian pasts, and he fought against time. For a few years he tried, but in the end Lawrence failed. He transformed and became the first of the great cleric beasts. Church hunters managed to kill Lawrence and sever his head, a feat not easily done, as never had a beast this great risen. But Lawrence would not be the last of these cleric beasts. He was an omen of what was to come in this new dawning era of violence. Lawrence's skull was taken back to the Grand Cathedral and his memory honored, but in death, he would not escape the blood curse of Kos. He was ushered into the hunter's nightmare as an eternally burning beast, his senses gone, his mind taken away. He would live on here in agony, penance for his terrible deeds. German, trapped in the hunter's dream, began to understand that he would find no escape from this workshop that he now inhabited. His endeavor to recreate his beloved Maria resulted in a doll that wasn't even a shadow of Maria's true nature. He was alone, the pawn of a great one trapped in a dream, severed from the waking world. And in his sleep, he cried to Lawrence and to Master Willem. He begged of them to help him, to free him. But for the first hunter, there would be no escape.
there would be no rescue. News of what happened to Lawrence, of course, reached Bergenworth and Master Willem. While tragic and horrifying, he'd for many years been studying and experimenting with insight. His path was far different from Lawrence, and Willem still possessed part of that umbilical cord which Lawrence had used to make contact with the Great One. He did not repeat Lawrence's mistake, though. Instead, the scholars of Bergenworth would elevate one of their own. They would make their own Great One, or something close to it. One named Rom was chosen, and amazingly, it worked. Somehow, the scholars of Bergenworth created a kin, Rom, the vacuous spider. Though not a true Great One, much like Ebrietus, Rom was proof that humanity could physically transcend into something more. Rom was housed safely within a lake nearby the college, in its own special plane where it could be studied and communed with. With this higher insight achieved, something began to appear around Yarnum, at least to those who possessed the eyes to see them, the Great Ones that would be called Amygdala. In particular, the School of Mensish began to have intermittent contact with them. It was their first step in establishing their own connections to the cosmos. How long the amygdala had been there is hard to say. Was it Rom's transcendence that got their attention? Were they there all along? Perhaps something to quantify them with time and motivation is pointless. But they became a worship deity around the city, in particular around Yahargo, where statues were built to honor them. But it is not yet time for the School of Mensis to take their steps forward. Instead, for now, they would study and wait and watch. With Lawrence gone, new leadership needed to be established for the Healing Church. This mostly came in the form of stronger hunter factions. In particular, the first of the church hunters, the one called Ludwig, became very popular both within the Healing Church and amongst participants in the hunt. Though he was not a vicar, Ludwig set into motion events within the church that would be of great importance. The Healing Church knew that Castle Kanehurst had come to possess old blood and took great issue with Kanehurst potentially acting as opposition to the church. Perhaps it was warranted, or perhaps it wasn't. After all, history tends to be written by the victor, so who truly can one trust in these things? But the Healing Church denounced Castle Kanehurst as vile bloods, heretics, and enemies. Under Ludwig's order, a faction called the Executioners were created, with a man called Logarius at the command. And Logarius was all the fanatic that one would expect. The Executioners trained in secret to specifically target Castle Kanehurst. And when their time finally came, the executioners marched upon Kanehurst. All residents of the land that they encountered while en route to the home of the vile bloods were slaughtered and made examples of. At the castle itself, those that could fought the executioners off. It was not a simple crusade, but rather a grand spectacle of mutually assured destruction. The women of Kanehurst were bound and beheaded. Their knights could not save them from that cruel fate. In the end, only a few executioners and their leader Lugarius made it to the top of Kanehurst, where the immortal Queen Annalise resided. It did not matter what was done to her, her body could not be killed. So, Lugarius stayed atop Castle Kanehurst and donned the Crown of Illusions. So long as he wore that crown, only he could enter the throne room where Annalise was now a prisoner. Martyr Lugarius would guard this place, keeping out anyone who would seek to aid the immortal Queen. And thus, the end of Castle Kanehurst. Back in Yarnum, the hunts became a regular and standard practice, highly normalized to the citizens of the city. A great number of mighty hunters and factions arose during this golden era of hunting, each with their own unique stories to tell. Explorations continued into the labyrinth beneath the city, with weapons, artifacts, and knowledge brought to the surface and integrated into this new society emerging within the dying city. Every facet of choking life now revolved around the healing church and by extension the choir, the school of Mensis, and the hunt. There were no power checks against any of them. The fate of Yarnum was written in its own blood and it was only a matter of time. As things became more desperate, the healing church, the school, and the choir began to turn on one another, or in the very least, declined to share in cooperation. Spying began to take place, distrust built, and the School of Mensis even began kidnapping members of the church and the choir to perform experiments upon. But the hunt did continue for some years. Life did find a way in Yarnum for a while. It was the School of Mensis that took their turn with the cosmos next. Lawrence's failure and end was no secret. The vacuous spider Rom was known within their circles and the choir still communed with their docile Ebrietus. Now it was their turn, it was their time to find their ascension. The School of Mensis had long been a secretive institution to be feared. It was brutal, merciless, broke every taboo, all in the name of their own progress. They would now beckon the moon. 
Where Lawrence failed, their greatest minds would all as one succeed. After all, the amygdala had held audience with the school before, so were they not favored in this endeavor? It was a former student of Master Willem of Bergenworth that would oversee this affair, the one called Mikolash. In a madman's ritual, the school of Mensis gathered, and using their own umbilical cord fragment, they together beckoned to the moon to gain an audience with the true Great One. And what happened next is hard to decipher. The scholars of the school caused their own brains to become stillborn. They were wiped out, and their minds sent into a brand new nightmare of their own making. Oh yes, they made contact with something, but it was not the moon presence, nor was it an amygdala. They beckoned Mergo, the child of old Queen Yarnum and formless Odin. The nightmare of Mensis began to take form. All from the school of Mensis, save a lucky few souls, were pulled into this new nightmare. Mikolash himself acted as the host, protected from body death by that piece of the umbilical cord he held in the waking world, and the crying baby Mergo would be the anchor. It was the vacuous spider Rom that stayed the fall of this ritual. Rom itself acted as a barrier, protecting the waking world from the nightmare of Mensis. Master Willem and the scholars remaining at the college suffered dramatically at this event. Willem himself was robbed of his senses, the many eyes now lining his mind did not save him. Bergenworth was lost, all within claimed, falling into its own quiet, sorry nightmare of sorts. For as long as he had left, Willem would sit at the lakeside in his chair, overlooking where Rom was hidden away watching the moonlight. Though the nightmare of Mensis was held back by Rom, this was no salvation. Ludwig, the apparent head figure of the healing church after Lawrence, fell into beasthood. The hunter of hunters Eileen the Crow had to end his life after he transformed. Ludwig, too, passed into the terrible hunter's nightmare to carry on in eternal torment and suffering for his blood-drunk deeds in life. All roads to Bergenworth were declared forbidden grounds. The secrets of what were out there were lost to the madness of the spreading beast's scourge. New hunters continued to come into the city, indulging in the intoxicating madness of blood consumption and beast slaying. The choir named a new vicar, the one called Amelia, would now lead the church. But then, another change began. The hunters started to vanish from the waking world. When Koss cursed the hunters that defiled her body, that blood curse was extended to all hunters who would fall into blood drunkenness and violence. So many years after the slaughter at that fishing hamlet, that promise still rang true. The hunters of Yarnum were one by one ushered into the hunter's nightmare, leaving the beast-ridden streets of Yarnum to be patrolled by its own citizens, though by now, it was hard to tell the infected from the standard citizen. So far had the city fallen that it was all but lost to beasthood. The hunters were eventually forgotten by those within Yarnum. The healing church no longer acknowledged them, the school of Mensis was a graveyard. Within the nightmare of Mensis, Mikolash and the scholars of the school carried on with their studies, finding their own rotted great one that they called the brain of Mensis within. The choir retained very little standing in society, but they continued their work creating celestial emissaries, children that were transformed by their experiments into weak kin creatures. Through them and Ebrietus, they hoped that they could still commune with the great ones and bring about a new stage in human evolution. But rumors of the miraculous healing blood of Yarnum did not cease in the outside world. Some still went into the city seeking out cures for terrible diseases, and there were some within the city who were all too willing to accommodate those brave enough to seek it. One such soul entered Yarnum on the evening of a hunt, seeking out a cure for some unknown illness that they suffered greatly from. All they had to do, all you have to do, is sign the contract. Take the transfusion and just rest your eyes. For when the hunt begins, you'll need your strength and your wits. Welcome to Yarnum, new hunter. There will be no escape.